This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Thursday, November 30th, 2023 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and I'm excited for this hour with you to provide you actionable material as well as data that you can use, you can take back and help you make the complex decision a little simpler, a little easier about what to do with your money, your investments. And we talk about it. This is Invest Talk, and we talk a lot about investing, obviously, but we try to touch on more than just that. Personal finance is part of this as well. So we're going to hit on a lot of topics, but most importantly, your topics, whatever is on your mind. So your calls are encouraged. 8899 chart is the number to get through. So don't hesitate to pick up that phone. Now we're going to hit on the market performance today. We're going to run down some show topics right after we answer our first caller question now. Hi, uh, this is Dan from Walnut Creek, and I have a question on one main holdings. The stock symbol is OMF. Looks like it's making a move up again. You know, I'm kind of confused about this stock because the numbers seem to look really well, really good as far as what I can see, but it pays a huge dividend, in my opinion, a lot of debt. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on this stock. Any information you can provide, I'd appreciate it. Thanks very much. Bye. Yeah, this is One Main Holdings, and this is a company that does have a lot of debt. Now, that kind of cuts both ways for a financial institution like this because they're engaged in non-prime, meaning subprime, that's what non-prime means, consumer financing, and that can be very profitable, especially when there's not a credit event. They offer personal loan products, uh, credit and non-credit insurance, so they service loans, they do acquisitions, they're quite complex. And once again, <clears throat> leverage is fine as long as the consumer defaults remain relatively low. Now, consumer defaults are rising. You will see that in social media, and I see this a lot. This is one thing I, I really want to a, – a broader message I want to hit home when you see things on social media uh, and data. Remember, data can be messed with, and especially in today's world, it's easy to say, well, these defaults, I see this a lot, defaults are up X percent, 50%, 80%, 100%, 200%, whatever it is, right? Sounds like a big number. But what you have to realize is that we're coming off of, in many instances in, in the economy, very, very low numbers. And so right, if you go from one to two, that's a 100% increase. If you go from two to three, it's the same nominal increase, but it's only a 50% increase, right, from two to three. So be careful when you're seeing these default numbers and the percentage increase, okay? Base effects matter. Now, if going back to one main holdings, this is doing well recently because credit spreads are tightening again. There's not a credit event. There's not a hard landing. The Fed is looking to be less hawkish. That's all positive for one main holdings. But this is going to be very, very cyclical. If you go through a default cycle on the consumer, this is going to get hit and probably hit a lot. So near term, I think it's fine uh, because I don't see a credit event on the horizon. Uh, but going back to – and also going back to that dividend, which you, you talked a lot about, they – had been paying pretty big dividends up until 2022, early last year. And then they just kept it flat. They haven't been increasing it. What that shows you is that that dividend is not sustainable. When you go through a process of continually increasing the dividend and then suddenly you stop it, you stopped it for a reason. Okay. So don't expect, don't buy this for the dividend. Buy this because of near term trends in the market, in the lack of a default cycle. And therefore, their earnings are going to remain 
Fine. And analysts are showing that. They made nine dollars and eighty-seven cents last year. Seven dollars. Sorry, that was nine eighty-seven in twenty twenty-one. Seven dollars and a penny last year. So it's earned five dollars and forty-three cents this year, and nearly seven dollars again next year. So you're supposed to have that rebound, but the growth trends are, are very meager, kind of flat over the past year or so uh, on the revenue side, and obviously earnings trends are, are a bit down. So overall. Near term, I think it's fine. Technicals are fine. Once again, default cycle isn't here. Um, but this is not a long-term play on a dividend. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as a short-term, near-term uh, technical play. All right. Let's go to Alex in Philadelphia. He wants to look at C-O-R, which is Sencora. Sencora, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. hi, hi, Justin. Uh, yeah, my I, my question was about Sencor itself, but mm-hmm. more so I have an employee stock purchase program. I listened to the program yesterday, okay. and you guys were talking about the employee stock options. I was wondering if mm-hmm. you could tell me your thoughts on how to frame an after-tax investment strategy involving an ESVP. And I know it depends on discount and ticker and all that stuff, but you know, if you want numbers for, for mine, I can give you them. But uh, just wondering your thoughts on that in general. Mm-hmm. I'd have to. I think it's better to do this kind of offer if you want to do like a, a review, a portfolio review, or something like that, and get us the details. So I can kind of go over this uh, kind of off air, uh, because everyone's a little bit different. Their their tax situation matters. Uh, what your total assets are, and you know, it sounds like you work for this company, correct? Yes. Okay. So, how much is how much you have in this stock uh, today? Also, what is your vesting schedule going forward? That's going to be uh, significant. So, what is kind of the total exposure here of the next time frame of you, you, you working for the company, for example? And then, how does that compare to the rest of your financial assets, both your four hundred one k and then maybe non four hundred one k assets? Um, all of that kind of comes into play of how aggressive you should be in selling off your stock. Obviously, Sencora is doing well right now. Uh, but you know, we're, it's in the distribu- medical distribution business. That's obviously a good business. McKesson and Cardinal Health, obviously, uh, two other big competitors there. And uh, this is a time where you probably rather be, you know, you want to sell into strength is generally what I what I try to say. Um, but you want to do that in a, a smart, tax efficient way. Um, so I really would encourage us to have a off the air conversation, just so I can kind of look at your whole picture uh, and, and me visualize it as well, as opposed to you just kind of telling me that can be kind of difficult to to grasp in, in context to the rest of your uh, portfolio. So yeah, I would, I would encourage you to head over to investtalk.com, click that portfolio view button. You can type out uh, a general explanation and then we can get on a call and go over the details a little bit further. Sound good, Alex? Yeah, thanks so much, Justin. Appreciate it. No problem. All right, we're heading into a break. So let me tell you about the Invest Talk Sector Spotlight Series. It's free. It's available now over on our YouTube channel. The latest episode is in regards to the material sector. Luke and I go over metals, chemicals, construction materials, and more, and how the current global events and supply chain disruptions impact these sectors' performance overall. So head over to our YouTube channel and click on the Invest Talk Sector Spotlight series. The phone lines are open, waiting for your questions at 888 chart When listener questions are played on the Invest Talk podcast, how do you guys determine a value stock? The caller voices are amplified many thousands of times. Just wanted to get your opinion on JP Morgan and BAC. How do you see this uh, looking forward? I'm 25 years old and have a question about retirement funds. And the unbiased answers from Justin Klein. That's why it's trading so cheap because there's a lot of regulatory risk. And Steve Peasley. I, I kind of like it here. If I was going to buy Tyson Food, this is where I'd buy it. Benefit the entire Invest Talk community. Thank you for what you guys do. That's why 24 7, rain or shine, no matter how simple or how complex, your questions make a difference. Symbol BKE, what's your outlook? And Invest Talk is made better by the power of you. So don't forget to call 888 99 Chart.
your objective is to work hard, plan well, and achieve financial freedom, right? You're in luck because Justin Klein is here now, ready to take your finance and investment questions. Call 888-99-CHART. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 40 minutes or so. Our main focus point is in regards to the bond ladder ETFs and how they can help investors climb higher. And putting money into ETFs with staggered maturities can create an ETF bond ladder. And we're going to look at those ETF bond ladders versus traditional bond funds and a traditional bond ladder and how to build a bond ladder ETF. Okay, so we're going to look at that story. Also, the green transition. Well, in the in Wall Street world, there was a lot of hope and hype around it. And many companies, especially EV names, and those that were pivoting to EVs, benefited from a market cap perspective early on. But that has all shifted. The S&P Global Clean Energy Index has fallen 30% this year. So we're going to talk about why. Also, the ESG craze for investors is fading. And so this is kind of related to the, the, the green energy, but we're going to look at some data on where money is moving within these ESG funds. And then lastly, Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona is becoming a magnet for chip manufacturing production. So we're going to talk about why that is. All right. We also have some voice bank questions we're going to get to. One is regards to 401k rollovers and Avalon Bay communities. Now let's look at the market performance today. It was a decidedly negative day overall. Uh, sorry, decidedly positive day overall. Uh, but it was negative in certain areas, especially technology and communication services. Communication services down three quarters of 1%. Technology was down slightly. Consumer cyclicals down slightly. And this was, I think, the, the first clear rollover of growth to value so far over the past, the, 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 the momentum. So you saw all last year, value drastically outperformed. And then this year you had growth outperforming strongly through, let's call it uh, middle of summer. And for the back half of the summer, growth still outperformed slightly, but at a much slower pace. But that all started to shift in a bigger way in October. Mid-October is when that ratio peaked, and now it is in a clear down trend. And today was the first lower low that was made since that high. We had a pivot. We had a little bit of rebound in growth stocks earlier in November, and that rolled over starting – what date was that? November 14th. And it's been pretty much grinding lower ever since. And you're seeing that underperformance of some of the major growth stocks in the market. So as I talked about, I think it was Monday, we had that main focus point and we got growth to value. And it's so funny. When you see the headlines, this is a perfect example. You see those headlines. I saw multiple places from the Wall Street Journal to the Financial Times, uh, Market Watch. They were all kind of highlighting this. And that's... Nine times out of 10, you fade those headlines, meaning that's the worst time you want to allocate to that. In fact, you want to do the exact opposite of what that trend is, what, what, that, what that media outlet is trying to tell you about where to put your money. Oh, look, look at this recent performance. No, that's not how you invest. Okay. In fact, you typically do the opposite, and that's what's happening right now. Amazon was down today. Tesla down 1.6%. Where large cap growth, where large cap stocks in general are up about four tenths of one percent, mid caps were up three quarters of one percent. Nvidia was down three percent. Okay. What else? What else was down big? GameStop down ten percent. Weibo down ten percent. 
Cracker Barrel, even down 10%. So some uh, major rotation today in the markets. You had the PCE number that was pretty much in line. So inflation continues to moderate. That's not really uh, an issue. And therefore, and the dollar's uh, remaining weak. Uh, even though it was up a little bit today, uh, you're continuing to you're starting to see that rotation out of growth and into value, and that was the big story in today's market, and likely the story heading into the end of the year. All right, we're going into a quick break. Please remember that you can call anytime and leave your questions on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. If you're listening via the live stream on AM twelve twenty radio in the Silicon Valley area, you can call right now at eight 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 ninety nine chart. The stock market is constantly changing, and serious investors know that they need to modify their portfolio assets to fit the times. And now, with more than 50 million downloads, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley reaffirm their commitment to providing unbiased finance and investment guidance here on Invest Talk. 888 99Chart. Now, our main focus point is set up by this headline. Bond ladder ETFs can help investors climb higher. And these are fairly new ETF offerings compared to the history of ETFs, which is now 30 years long. And so we're going to dig into how these new ETF bond ladders compare to bond funds and traditional bond ladders and how to build a bond ladder ETF. Okay. So far this year, through the end of October, so that's shifted uh, this month, obviously bonds have rallied, but then in October, the US core bond index was down 2.7%. Now I believe it's up. Let me take a look here. Are we up yet? We're pretty getting pretty close. No, we're not up yet, but it's still so it's still down in the year. And that could, that this could mean three straight years of bond losses. So if you start with 2021, a cumulative 16.7% loss, which for bond investors, that's huge. Okay. Now the good thing is bonds are actually a lot more attractive than they've been, despite them being down. Because Pretty much across the curve, you can get 5% or more, even in treasuries. Now, for our clients, we tend to buy individual bond ladders. That's what we do. Meaning we're buying different bonds across the curve going out a certain number of years. Right now, we're focusing kind of in the two to five year range. Keep duration pretty short. Now, for the average person, that can be difficult for a couple of reasons. Cost of trade, spreads for the average person, average investor buying individual bonds, you're going to pay a, a pretty hefty spread. Whereas institutions, we aggregate our bond bonds together, bond purchases together, and the spreads are a lot tighter and thus better yields. So that's number one. Number two is you need to have a good amount of money to do a traditional bond ladder. Why? Because you typically have to buy roughly $5,000 per bond. So if you only have, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty five thousand dollars $25,000, a bond ladder for individual bonds can be difficult. And then the research. Which ones do you want to buy? Based on your tax rate, do you want to buy munis? Do you want to buy corporates? If you buy corporates, do you buy investment grade or do you buy junk? How much credit risk do you want to take? So all of this can be done, but it can be challenging. But if done right, you can create a predictable income stream that prevents from major losses, especially if there's no defaults. Right With a bond fund... People sell their bond fund, and the manager has to sell the bonds that you own within that bond fund 
to meet those redemptions. There can be permanent losses there because when real yields drop again, those bonds aren't there to make up, to rally, right? So that's why in bond funds in general can be bad, especially in a generally rising rate environment. So the solution that the industry has is are these target dated bond funds or defined maturity ETFs. iShares has 47 of them. Bullet shares has 31 of them. Those are kind of the two major uh, offerings there. So what they do is, for example, if it's a 2024 fund, it only buys bonds that mature between January 1st of 2024 and December 15th of 2024. And then once the last bond matures, December 15th, the fund wraps up, goes away, gives you back the NAV, the net asset value at the end of the time, which should be, as long as there's no major defaults, roughly par. So what this does is it helps you define your duration risk. And that duration isn't constantly moving. So you're basically constantly moving towards lower and lower duration over time. So that's how it works. Every day and week and month that passes, you get closer to those bonds maturing. Now, there are different things you have to look out for. One is callable bonds. How many callable bonds are these bond managers buying? So that can actually shorten the duration, right? Where the, some of those calls get bo- those bonds get called if rates drop. So that's something that you have to kind of look out for. But these can be valuable for those that don't have the time, want instant diversity, right? Don't have the time to do the research, so they get instant diversification across a lot of different bonds within the particular asset class that these bond funds are uh, are targeting, and then. You can say, I only want three years maturity. Could work, especially if you have use for that cash in three years and you only want to, you want to make sure that uh, you want to take that after three years, maybe put it in a, uh, in a money market account and now you spend it the year after. That can be a way to uh, match your maturity schedule with your liquidity needs. Okay. Now we're heading into a break. I'm ready for your questions right now at 888 chart This message is sponsored by Greenlight, the debit card and money app made for families. If you are a parent, have you noticed that as you are online, you may often see ads for various parenting hacks? In other words, quick solutions to tricky problems. Some hacks may be good ideas, others maybe not. Well, if you are committed to raising children that are made smarter and stronger by learning about financial responsibility, I encourage you to check out Greenlight. You see, as a debit card and money app made for families, Greenlight gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy while providing peace of mind for parents. With Greenlight, you can send instant money transfers, automate your kids' allowance, and keep an eye on their spending with real-time notifications. Meanwhile, Your kids can begin their journey towards financial autonomy by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. The Greenlight app includes a chores feature so you can set up recurring or one-time tasks that are customized to your family's needs and then reward your young ones for a job well done. Since 2017, Greenlight has helped more than 6 million parents and kids manage their finances. In fact, with Greenlight tools, families can even learn to invest together. Sign up today for Greenlight, the debit card and money app made for families and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash invest talk. That's greenlight.com slash invest talk to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash invest talk. Let's take a quick look at your financial to-do list. At the top, Make that phone call to the Invest Talk Anytime listener line. Steve Peasley and Justin Klein will provide unbiased answers to your questions. Invest Talk, 888-99-CHART.
800-892-4278. Now, in the next Invest Talk, we'll look into this story, why it's important to retire with purpose. Retirement isn't the freedom from work, but the freedom to do your life's work. So we'll touch on that topic tomorrow. But now let's pivot back to the Invest, Invest Talk Voice Bank for another caller question at 888-99-CHART. Hey, good morning. This is Eric from California. I just had a question regarding 401k rollovers. I currently have a 401k plan from an old employer. I went to roll it into an IRA and they informed me that it is not able to be rolled over with any distributions or any rollovers for your retirement. And I was curious if you've ever heard of something like that or if I'm getting misinformation. So I've never run into a case like that with any friends or any colleagues. So just looking forward to hearing your guys' response on the podcast. All right. Bye. No, you're talking to the wrong person or they're giving you wrong information. If it is truly just a traditional 401k, you've left that employer, you're no longer contributing to it, you can roll that into an IRA. Uh, there's Someone's not telling you the truth. Uh, or you maybe it's a Roth 401k and you're trying to roll it into a traditional IRA. Make sure That could be a potential. And then you want to roll that into a Roth IRA. Maybe that's the issue. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, you're, you, you definitely can do that. And for everyone else out there, if you ever have an old 401k like this, you want to roll it into an IRA, not your new employer's 401k. There's very little reason to do that. Uh, there are some creditor protections that are a little bit better with 401ks, but unless you plan on filing for bankruptcy anytime soon, the flexibility of investing whatever you want in an IRA typically outweighs that creditor protection. So yeah, definitely talk to somebody else because that does not make any sense. All right. Now let's touch a bit on the green trans transition. And so far the global clean, clean, clean energy index has fallen 30%. And you know, just a few years ago, Wall Street got excited about this transition. Ford launched its electric Mustang and pickup truck. Valuations in Ford stock jumped to over $100 billion. Now it's down to $42 billion. Why? Because EV demand is falling, much short of expectations. And manufacturers are dialing back their investment in the space. Some are even buying back stock instead. And the main reason is simply the economics of getting to cleaner emissions is simply bad. Someone has to pay for it. Shareholders and consumers decided at least this year, it won't be them. Now, technological transformations are typically positive because they're a more efficient, better way of doing something. And so naturally, investment gravitates there because of efficiency. But that's not what the green transition is. In most instances, it's not more efficient. Only in certain applications where the wind blows consistently and strong, wind can make sense. Where it's sunny, the vast majority of the year, solar can make sense. But those are small slivers of Earth in general. Now, we do have some pretty good spaces here in the U.S., but, you know, we're installing solar panels in the Northeast, for example, where it just doesn't make financial sense. So this is what we call a negative supply shock. And so profitability within the space is hard to come by. Investment calls for basically offloading the externalities, climate externalities of fossil fuels. And you can argue from a policy perspective, that's a good thing. I'm not arguing against that. But from an economic perspective, this doesn't increase productivity in any way. But it has to be financed, and financing costs continue to go up. So 
So I think that's the huge issue here. Now there's the cap and trade system that Europe has adopted, but that increases costs across the board, across the economy. And this is why you have discontent in places like France. Think of the yellow vest protests. And far right shifts in many elections. Dutch elections just uh, just elected a far right freedom party. They want to ditch all climate regulations. Now, the solution here in the United States, at least by the Biden administration, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is to say it's, it's not going to be borne by – the cost is not going to be borne by the companies because we're going to subsidize investment in this space. The problem is, is that, yes, you can subsidize battery production and some inputs – to EVs, for example, but still, that's only a small sliver of the total pie uh, and the resources that go in from capital to labor. And then you have restrictions within the Inflation Reduction Act, which are made in America. So as we know, our supply chains are not exactly very robust. And then there's green tech inflation, meaning yeah, you're pushing more demand, but is there enough supply of certain metals to keep up with it? And the answer is simply no. And it, it, when you're building anything, especially a car, one piece that you don't have that's too expensive suddenly stops the whole process. And so what you're seeing now is the cost for wind and solar are going up since 2021. And many developers in the utility space contracted rates that they just can't afford anymore because of higher financing costs. So that's why you're seeing a lot of these utility companies, NEE is the, first, the, the main example, NextEra, has been investing in clean energy. And at low rates, it made sense. But now it doesn't at higher rates. And when the economy softens, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar EVs suddenly become not very affordable. So while I think you're going to continue to see a push towards investment in green energy and governments finding ways to incentivize, it's pretty clear that they haven't figured out a winning formula that doesn't create political problems and that, do, that that actually is good for business. In most instances right now, this has been bad for business. Whether you like it or not, those are the facts. Now, as I expect you know, we get calls from around the world and across America, but here's a question that came in earlier from, Inve from an InvestDoc listener here in L.A. Hey, Justin, this is Frank from Los Angeles. I just wanted to ask you about Avalon Bay, uh, ticker symbol AVB. I think last October you mentioned that there is probably an oversupply of apartment units coming to the market, and you suggested to stay away from this sector. However, with the current level of interest rates, I believe that some of these residential REITs are still positioned to do well. So among those, Avalon Bay is probably my favorite in terms of uh, diversification, geographic focus, and fundamentals. I would love to get your opinion on it. And if you have a price target where you think it uh, could be good to pick some up, that would be appreciated. I also wanted to ask you how you see this sector compared to manufactured housing rates. Do you think uh, that in this environment, manufactured housing rates might perform relatively better than residential rates? Thanks so much, and I'll be listening on the show. Well, this – I wouldn't call this a residential REIT. This is an apartment REIT. I think residential REITs that own individual homes, and there are some of those REITs out there. This is Avalon Bay Communities and it's a portfolio of 276 apartment communities with over 82,000 units and developing 18 additional ones with over 5,700 units. And like you said, they are – well diversified, but the problem is, is they're mainly in major metropolitan areas, New England, 
New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., here in California and the Pacific Northwest, all areas where people are moving out and there's actually rent pressure to the downside. And this recent rebound in REITs, Avalon Bay is not catching a bid compared to the, the rest of the REIT sector. So I I don't like this. Uh, I think that you you don't want exposure to apartments. I, I, you hit it on the head. I've said you have a record number of apartment communities hitting market over the next couple of years, and that's going to drastically increase the supply of apartments available. Higher supply, I don't really think there's going to be much higher demand. You could argue, yes, high interest rates and low affordability in the housing market will incre- keep people renting. But if people are losing their jobs, they're going to there's not going to be a lot of household formation, meaning people moving out from their parents and renting an apartment, for example. And then if they are, they may be doing that in more of the suburbs, away from the big cities. So I'm okay with the home rental market. I think it's better because there's not that huge supply coming on market. And I would want something that is more, I would say, the smile of the country, right? South and and, uh, the West. South, Southeast, West, uh, Pacific, not, not the Pacific Northwest, right? So... Yeah, this is not a name that I would be excited to jump in on. All right, now we're deep into the fourth quarter. December will be here tomorrow. We are through the month of November, 11 months in. So right around the corner is the new year, which probably means you need to reassess where you're at. How your portfolio and strategy is, if it is fit for this economy, this market, and your goals. So I encourage you to reach out to myself or Steve at our company, KAPP Financial, where we operate with the same philosophy, which is independent thinking and shared success. We provide unbiased guidance, both on and off air, and we practice parallel investing, which means you invest right alongside our clients. So I encourage you to take advantage of our free portfolio review assessment via telephone or go to meetings. Send us a message through investtalk.com. Hang on. Our work continues next. In today's world, a variety of factors are affecting the stock markets. Serious investors know building a secure financial future requires hard work and determination. That's why now, more than ever, when it comes to the planning, execution, and maintenance of your portfolio, you need InvestTalk. InvestTalk is a free download. Your participation makes it unique. Don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Hello, Invest Talk. My name is uh, Brian. I'm from Ohio. I'd like to see what you thought about the stock Stanley Black & Decker, ticker symbol SWK. I'd like to hear what you think the fair value price is on the stock and also what you think how it might do in the future. Thank you. Oh, this is an interesting one. Stanley Black & Decker, this has been a bellwether kind of mid-cap for a long period of time. It earned $8.40 in 2019, a little over $8 in 2020, understandable, had the pandemic. Then 2021 earned $10.59, but it's been a rough sledding since then. $4.88 last year, $1.31 expected this year, back to $4.48 next year. Now, Sark's upgrading those earnings expectations, I like that. The debt profile is modest. It's not bad. I don't have an issue with it. Uh, let's see here. Revenue growth is slowed. It's now negative over the past couple quarters, but that's okay. Earnings last quarter were dollar, so it got back to profitability. It's three quarters in a row is negative. It lost money. But this is not a name that historically loses money. Return on equity now is negative, but historically kind of hangs around the mid-teens range over the last 30, 30, 40 years. So I like what you're looking at, a company with a good brand. Their products are always going to be in demand, always going to need power tools. 
And it's going through some rough times. I'd have to dig into why that is to see if anything permanent, but I like what you're looking at. This should trend back to its longer term earnings potential, which is closer to eight bucks. And at that rate, $90 per share is pretty cheap. Talking about 11, 12 times earnings. The technicals have improved, but they're not amazing. So this would be a above average risk on a good brand. And you could just simply use the out of late last year, around $70 per share, around 93 now. Or sorry, 90 now. Excuse me, $91. So I'm going to give this one a thumbs up. I like the brand. All right, this is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. And we have one goal here to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So if you, if you have a question, I encourage you to call right now at 888 chart Everybody wants a secure financial future, but getting there takes strategy, discipline, and the right information. Justin Klein is ready to provide his unbiased answers. So don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99 chart. Hey Justin and Steve, thank you so much for the show. I have two questions. I recently sold a property and have around two hundred thousand dollars in cash. My first question is: Should I deploy all the money into the market at once, or invest it into some specific stocks that I've chosen over the next twelve months? And the stocks that I was looking to purchase were Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, and Vanguard Value ETF (VTV). Thanks so much. Love the show, and I'll await the answer. Thank you. Oh, well, definitely not NVIDIA. Uh, that's starting to roll over. And just the, the large cap space is is rolling over. Um, Apple, uh, of the Mag7, Apple and Microsoft are certainly the best based on valuation, based on quality of business, et cetera. So those are fine. But I do think if you continue to get this rollover growth versus value, those are going to come with it. VTV, Vanguard value, much better. Um, now we are overbought in your term. So do you get a pullback over the next three months? Probably at some point. I don't know what from what levels. We're in the Santa Claus rally. So that tends to mean probably choppy to modest upside at year end. And then the first quarter, a lot depends on do we get a soft landing or a hard landing. So far, indications show that we're having a soft landing. Continued deceleration in growth, but still growth. So putting it all at once, historically, that says that that, that tells you uh, the numbers tell you it's better. But we're in a choppy period. I still think we're going to be in the choppy period for some time until there's some clarity on the trajectory of the economy next year. Is it hard or is it soft? Is it a mild recession or something that's a major credit event? It's a major credit event. You usually see a 15, 20% downside in the market. But with fiscal spending remaining kind of set in stone with the amount of Social Security that's out there with all the boomers that have retired collecting Social Security. They got a nearly 9% pay raise this year. Going to get about a 4% pay raise next year. That all is money going into the economy. Housing prices remain relatively high. People have equity, tend to spend. So it's hard to say exactly where the market's going to go in the short term, but you know I expect a choppy period. So I would say dollar cost average, but would not be, NVIDIA wouldn't be in that on that list. Okay. Now, lastly, let's talk about ESG. ESG was all the craze just a few years ago. But now, quietly companies, fund families are scrubbing the names from the titles in their funds. And many are closing shop. We just talked about how high interest rates have slammed clean energy stocks. And has made the whole ESG movement not as profitable. I said this 
a year ago, two years ago, I was talking about this, that this was a fad and that it's all well and good when those companies are doing well, but when they're not, all of a sudden people have less angst to get into these names. And the third quarter was the first time more sustainable fund funds liquidated or removed ESG criteria from their investment practice than were added. For example, in 2021, Hartford Funds inserted sustainable into the name of its core bond fund, and they saw $100 million come in. So a lot of this was just chasing cash, chasing those investors that were buying into this fad. But they've missed performance targets, and Hartford is now switching gears. It's removing that from its name and going back to its more traditional investment strategy. And at least five other funds announced they would drop ESG mandates this year, and another 32 funds will close. And investors withdrew $14 billion from sustainable funds this year. And it's becoming political, right, with Vivek Ramaswamy as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Ron DeSantis, right, pushing back on BlackRock in Florida. It's becoming a political football as well. So you combine with the political polarization, the poor investment choices and the lack of clear criteria of what ESG really is, it's pretty clear that this fa- this fad is on the downturn and will probably, I think, disappear for the lexicon for some time until they rebrand it for, with something else. All right, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve and I thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, Call 1-800-557-5461.